who kneel as we seek our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning we just want to thank you for this privilege that we have of being here in your house of worship today where we can come to praise your wonderful name <clears throat> to thank you Lord for your many blessings for your love and your grace shared so freely with each one of us today Father we think of those that don't have this privilege there are many around the world today suffering, Lord, for you. And we just pray that you will be with each one at this time. Father, we're just so grateful for the sacrifice that you made on Calvary us, for us and the assurance that you've given us of resurrection and spending and going to heaven with you when you come for each one of us. Father, again, we just want to thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, this morning that you've forgiven us as we've asked in your name those things that we've done and said that aren't acceptable to you. Lord, we just pray that you'll give us strength to be overcomers, to press on to the mark, to be there to encourage others to come to know you as our personal saviour. Father, again, this morning we just think of those that aren't here with us, those that are finding the way hard. Lord, we just pray that you'll be with each one and bless them just wherever they are today those aren't, the, aren't well Lord we pray too for a special blessing pray that your arms of love will be with joy at this time pray for, that you'll be give her the comfort and the strength that she needs and with Merv too Lord we just pray that you'll encompass this family with your love at this time and Lord, uh, we just think of Dave and Jocelyn too at this time. We just pray that you'll be with them in a special way on this, your Sabbath day. We think of our young people, our youth, our children, our parents. Lord, we just pray that you'll give each one wisdom and guidance that they can bring their children to come to know you as their special personal saviour. Again, we want to thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, that John has given his time this morning to be with us and to present your word. Might our hearts be open, our minds be clear, that we will understand, and it will be a blessing for us, each one, today. Pray now that you'll be here, one of our number, that we will be conscious of your presence right here in our midst this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Not too long ago, I had a super interesting encounter on a flight out of Denver. As I took my seat and began reading whatever book I happened to have with me, it became obvious that the guy sitting next to me was looking over my shoulder and catching a few glances of whatever it was. He must have saw the word God or some religious terminology because rather casually, the guy leaned over and he says, looks like an interesting book. But then after a short pause, just bluntly out of nowhere, the guy says, but I'm an atheist. Well, evidently he was an outgoing guy and looking for some conversation. So I said, actually, I'm an atheist too. Clearly, he was a little surprised, no doubt because of the book I was reading. He was like, seriously, you're an atheist? Yeah, absolutely, I told him. Then I threw him an unexpected curveball. I said, describe for me the God you don't believe in. He was jolted, to say the least, by the question. But I knew that there was some definable picture of God in his head that gave rise to his atheism. But he went 
of silence. So I figured, conversation over. But then after thinking for a moment or two, the guy opens the conversation again, and he says, you know what I mean, a super powerful supreme being presiding somewhere in the sky that rules over us with absolute control. He, he paused again, and then he just plowed forward, man. He just let it all out. You know, before we're born, this God decides who gets to go to heaven, who's going to burn in hell forever. Of course, we have no say in the matter because he's Mr. Almighty God. It's his universe. So how dare anybody question him? He can do whatever he jolly well pleases. Well, he was on a roll now, doing a great job of defining his atheism and mine too. It's all utter nonsense, he went on. And if we're supposed to love this tyrant, I don't even like him. And I'm pretty sure that liking someone has got to come before loving them. It, it's more like a monster than a god. I was right with this guy, I have to tell you. Just right with him. Yeah, I totally agree, I said. It's, it, it's, it's a pretty diabolical picture, huh? Yeah, he said. I don't know how anyone can believe in such a god. Me neither, I agree. I certainly don't. I don't believe in the existence of any such God as you just described. But I want to ask you another question. I mean, hypothetically, just for the sake of discussion, what if a God, the exact opposite of the one you've just described, could exist? Would you want him to? He was jolted again, just, just thinking about the idea. What do you mean, he says? Like what? So I offered a totally different picture. Well, what if a God could exist who is nothing but total goodness, perfectly just, perfectly merciful to everyone all the time? A God who always does the right thing toward every person. A God who would literally give everybody total freedom to decide their own destiny and never in a million years torture anybody who didn't agree with him. You know, what if a God could exist who is literally the kind of person who would rather die than commit an injustice against any person? I mean, if a God like that could exist, would you want him to? Now, I could see that this was totally new territory for him. But after thinking for just a few seconds, he said what any rational person would have to say. Well, sure, he said. I'd be a fool not to, right? Yeah, right. I agreed with him. Then he said, but, but no way, man. We can't just manufacture whatever God we want. And I agreed with him again. No, we can't manufacture whatever God we want. But he was listening, so I elaborated. Listen, man, I totally resonate with your atheism because I find many of the popular views of God as repulsive as you do. But I believe that the one and only true God is beautiful in the extreme. And you said that you would want that kind of God to exist if you could. Well, I simply do believe the very thing that you want to believe. So you're not really an atheist, he says to me? Well, actually I am. I'm an atheist in the sense that I don't believe in the cruel, tyrannical God you just described. But I do believe in God. But I believe in a God who is nothing like the God you don't believe in. So as far as I can see, you haven't rejected my God because the fact is you've never even considered him. I'm asking you to believe in a God of sheer beauty and perfect goodness. And, and I totally commend you for not believing in the false God that you were raised to believe in. I mean, this guy's mental wheels were turning. And you know what? I found that many people who don't believe in God don't believe in a particular picture of God. A self-serving, threatening tyrant who wants to either control us or damn us. They reject the only option they've ever been taught. While somewhere in their hearts, they desire a God worthy of their love and worship. I mean, what if? What if the God who does
does exist is nothing at all like many popular religions portray God to be. What if God is love in the strongest and most beautiful sense imaginable? What if? Knowing God as he is, and uh, what a powerful testimony. Can You can use that question, can't you? What is a great question. I wanted to start off with four texts. <clears throat> uh, John, uh, all in John. John 17.3, if you'd like to join me in looking for that. John 17.3. What do you think of when I say eternal life or life eternal? What do you think of? I'd like some feedback. <laughs> I'm much better, much more comfortable in the Sabbath school class than I am standing up here, I can tell you. I'm not a preacher. But what do you think of when you hear the words eternal life? Living forever. Living forever. Living forever. Yeah. No more hardship. No more hardship. <laughs> It, seeing God face to face, yeah. A lot of normally our first reaction is it's a long time, right? It's living for a long time. Let's have a look what Jesus said. Eternal life really is. In verse three of seventeen, this is eternal life that they may know you. He's praying to his Father at the time. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Isn't that amazing? Time doesn't really matter if you know him. And this is why he can say, you know, you have eternal life now. But let's have a look at another one. John 5, 19. John 5, 19. John 5, verse 19. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. And John 8, John 8, verses 33 to 44. In a discussion with the Jews, this is Jesus, 38 to 44. Just one thirty-eight. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. <clears throat> if you were Abraham's children, Jesus said, then you would do the things Abraham did. <clears throat> As it is, you are determined to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If, you, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now I am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. In him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. These people believed God was their father, and Satan really was. Isn't that amazing? Let's have a look at the last one, John 16. Uh, 2 and 3. John 16, uh, verses 2 and 3. He's talking to his disciples. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you 
will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. So our picture of God always determines the way we act towards him and towards other people. Do we hide from him? Do we hate him like the man on the video? Do we love him? Do we, are we afraid of him? And in our relationships with other people, do we criticize them? Do we envy them? Do we hate them or love them? Do we ignore them? Do we badmouth them? Or do we find something good about them and gossip about it? I wanted to really, the main part of my talk today really, is from the second, from the, from the book of Second Samuel and the ninth chapter. And I wrote it out. So I'll read it, basically read it to you. If you'd just like to turn to Second Samuel 2, 9, Second Samuel 9. With that thought in mind, our, the picture we have of God determines how we act. Second Samuel 9. I guess this would be the children's story. Sorry we didn't have something special for you today, but this is an amazing story that kids love. Second Samuel chapter 9. I'll read it. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. The king asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? Zebra answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. Zebra answered, He's at the house of Makur, son of Amiel in Lodibar. So King David had him brought from Lodibar, from the house of Makur, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. If you've got the King James, it says what? He fell on his face. He, David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth grandson of your master will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah and all the members of Ziba's household were servants to Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table and he was crippled in both feet. The son of Jonathan and the grandson of Saul, both of them were now dead. And he had fallen and become what we call paraplegic. And he lived in Lodibar, that name, the Hebrew meaning for that name, a place of no pasture. Mephibosheth would have grown up being told that King David was the enemy. You think? Remember the battle between Saul's household and David's? David was rising king. Saul was going down and he was in fact hunting David most of the time. But he, and, and Mephibosheth became a paraplegic because his nanny dropped him while she was trying to escape in fear at the news of Jonathan and Saul's death. And Mephibosheth was hidden away from David. You notice he never knew about him. So he would have been hidden from David. 
How strikingly this illustrates the condition of fallen man. Our disability, a sin problem, was really imposed on us by someone else, wasn't it? We were born with it because of our first father, Adam. No sooner had sin blinded the mind of Adam than we read that he hid himself from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Genesis 3. So many of us spend our lives pursuing amusements or escape from reality because we don't know any better. Our knowledge of God has come from his enemy. Many of us have been even blamed God for our disability and our misfortune. The Apostle Paul said the natural mind of man is hostile to God. He lives with God as his enemy and he dreads his presence. Perhaps you may say, I have sinned and that makes me afraid of God. True, you have sinned. I have sinned. All have sinned, but if you knew the price that he paid to take away that sin, that he spared not his own son, then you would see that God is the only one you can go to as a sinner and be assured. John, 1 John 1, 7, The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice in verse 1 of chapter 9 there, David said, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Isn't this just the same as the Holy Spirit? He's looking. Is there anyone left of the fallen sons and daughters of Adam to whom I can show the kindness of God? No matter how deeply they've fallen, they might be lame in both feet in a place of no pasture. <coughs> Wherever you are trying to hide from God, there's nothing in this world that can make you happy, is there? There's only one who will never disappoint you, Jesus Christ. A friend of mine often says to me uh, in the workplace, um, don't believe everything people say about others. He said that to me several times. And don't believe everything other people say about God. In verse 5, then King David sent and fetched him. Here is grace just like God, isn't it? We show kindness to those that, you know, we think deserve it. Or maybe something that we can get back. But God's not like that. Mephibosheth had done not one thing to merit the kindness. He couldn't. No grace went to fetch him from Lodibar, the very place where he was. And the Son of God came to us, poor sinners, just where we were. He came to fetch us and he found us paralyzed by our bad habits and our sins. And he took our place and died, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. Mephibosheth was too disabled to save himself. He had to be fetched. And the one who knows both man's disability and God's fetching grace said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. John six forty four. And again, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and he that comes to me I will not cast out. So many promises in, in the word that give us courage. If it had not been for this fetching grace, we would have all perished in our striving to hide away from God. In verse 6, when Mephibosheth was come to David, he fell on his face. What a picture of dread and fear. As the son of Saul, the one who had hunted David, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, the one who had hunted David, what could he expect? The next moment, the voice of stern justice might demand his life. There he lies, a picture of a tremble, trembling sinner brought into the presence of God. With a fearful load of guilt and sin, he doesn't know God. He doesn't know what to expect. Did you ever visit a place from your early life and look at for the first time on a child of one of your old friends? 
Just imagine this. If, you, if you've done, had that experience, you can imagine what David felt when he saw Mephibosheth. Can you imagine that? And you know, the voice wasn't stern justice, was it? He said, Mephibosheth, like, he just wanted to give him a hug. Behold your servant, was the trembling reply. Behold your servant is the highest thought of fallen man. He offers himself as a servant to God and hopes to be saved because of his serving. This is the religion of every human heart. But now hear the words of David. Like the father in the parable of the prodigal son, he cuts him short. Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake and will restore you to all the land of Saul your father and you shall eat bread at my table continually. This is God, isn't it? No conditions, no bargaining, not if you'll do this, I'll do that. He didn't say, if you don't do that, I'll do that. It's pure grace and kindness of God. I will surely show you kindness and that entirely for another's sake. And uh, you shall eat bread at my table continually. I gained a new appreciation for the covenant this week. The uh, goodness God shows to us is not because of anything we've done. It's because of his, his uh, agreement with his father. Am I misrepresenting or revealing the true character of God? Is this how he receives lost sinners? Are these his words to the wretched, trembling, death-deserving sinner? Can God the Father point to the cross of Christ and say, Fear not, I will surely show you kindness for Jesus' sake. All this without a single condition. We have difficulty with this, don't we? <laughs> we want to do something. All pure grace flowing from his own overflowing heart of love. Do you know this God? Let's have a look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 4. Ephesians 2 and verse 4 to 10. Ephesians is an amazing book. If you're ever feeling like you're... Christianity is a bit flat. Read Ephesians. Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Would we have sent to Mephibosheth a book of directions? How to repent? How to cure his feet? How to prepare to meet the king? There's no word of it here. He comes just as he is. Nothing more was required. How could there be when David's heart was already filled with love for him? King David never sent Mephibosheth a set of crutches. And he would have welcomed them, wouldn't he? And any of us would. The king's love is far greater than this. A sinner doesn't need a crutch. He needs a new life. And David gave him that, a whole new life. We need a new start and a new life with the ability to live it well. And Christianity's often been called a crutch, you'll find <laughs> There's people like the fellow in the plane. They think Christians are weak. They just have a crutch. But those of you who have 
experienced Christianity you know that's a very poor description, isn't it? And I could, I'd love to hand over the rest of the day to you. You could tell how great God is and how, what the great experience, what a great experience has been. But let me just talk briefly about the two covenants and the things I discovered.